We uh, were boosted some in the late 1990s by uh, when Congress and the FDA created some requirements and incentives for the inclusion of pediatrics in drug studies. So this isn't just solely for rheumatology, but the Pediatric Research Equity Act, or PREA, Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act, and, and the Orphan Drug Act. Um, I would be remiss to not start off a talk like this, uh, biologics and pediatric rheumatology, uh, to not um, uh, credit and, and give due respect to Dr. Lovell, who heads up the Pediatric uh, Rheumatology Collaborative Study Group from the Children's Hospital in Cincinnati. And he was the primary investigator on a study from the New England Journal of Medicine in 2000, um, which uh, was a randomized clinical trial, a discontinuation trial of children with active polyarticular, actually posyarticular and systemic JRA refractory to treatment with our uh, classic DMARD methotrexate. So 69 patients in the op open label portion. Uh, there were 74 that met definition of improvement at three months. And in the double-blind component, uh, disease flare, which was the primary endpoint, uh, was lower if the patient received a tanner sept and significantly lower, 28 to 81 percent, as well as a difference in time to flare was significant. So uh, stemming from this, uh, tanner sept became FDA approved for moderate to severe polyarticular JI in children. And then once there was more safety data that came out, the age uh, spectrum went from age four to age two, which is what it is now. Uh, similarly, uh, Dr. Lovell's group uh, studied uh, adalimumab, a similar study, a randomized discontinuation trial, uh, adalimumab with and without methotrexate and poly-JIA. There was a 16-week open-label treatment with adalimumab. Uh, responders were randomized to adalimumab or placebo in a double-blind, every other week fashion to 32 weeks. At the end of the 48-week double-blind phase, um, patients not receiving methotrexate, 43% in the adalimumab group flared versus 71, and you can see that's statistically significant. And the, among the patients not receiving met methotrexate, the results weren't too different. Um, and then the third drug that's uh, currently FDA approved for moderate to severe polyarticular JIA is abatacept. So the, the age range is not as low, uh, greater than or equal to six years of age. Um, and in a double-blind randomized controlled withdrawal, polyarticular disease refractory intolerant, uh, patients were refractory intolerant to greater than one or more DMARD. Um, flares were lower in the abatacept to placebo group during the double-blind withdrawal phase. Um, and interestingly, patients who previously had failed uh, anti-TNF therapy uh, with time, their ACR uh, PD-30 score, which is a modification of the ACR-30, uh, improved over the course of a, a six-month period. So, and then with long-term extension phase, it was found to be safe and well-tolerated. So, uh, that's just kind of a, a start off to start to talk about um, some little more nuances and some new findings in systemic JIA, um, uh, the autoinflammatory syndromes, touching on uh, also Kawasaki disease and a little bit on dermatomyositis. So in terms of juvenile idiopathic arthritis, you notice that first study, they were, were studying JRA. Well, soon after that, the criteria and the way the disease was classified uh, was changed to juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It's the same spectrum of illnesses, but they're subtyped into seven different forms. The systemic onset type in the adult rheumatology world is often termed Stills disease. In terms of our disease criteria, it's patients who have arthritis uh, with or preceded by fever of greater than two weeks duration, and the fever should have a quotidian pattern uh, spiking pattern often in the evening or early morning for uh, three days or more. And they should have two out of four of the following. Um, the majority of patients do have an evanescent erythematous rash, which you can see in this picture. It's often described as salmon colored, may have a, a Kebner phenomenon or uh, flare with heat and fever. Uh, generalized lymph node enlargement, uh, hepatomegaly or splenomegaly, um, and some form of serositis. So systemic JI in, in pediatric rheumatology has a variety of morbidities um, that are significant. Uh, macrophage activation syndrome is something that can be life-threatening. Uh, patients that 
persist with this active systemic onset, uh, JA and art in that more minor form of monophasic disease can get significant joint damage and are often a, uh, a subgroup of patients that, if left untreated, uh, are at risk of needing a joint replacement at a young age. Growth delay from active disease as well as um, profound steroid doses. Uh, serositis complications, uh, pulmonary, so uh, rarely there are significant pulmonary uh, issues with patients, whether it's uh, ILD or even pulmonary velar hemorrhage has been described. And then the, the um, intense effect of chronic steroids on a growing child. So uh, thankfully, Virginia Pasquale um, at UT Southwestern had the insight to do a translation, translational study where they took uh, sera from systemic JI patients, from just four patients, and there were different um, they were taken at different times, some when patients had fever and some when they, when they actually didn't. Um, and they induced healthy uh, peripheral bud monocytes and found that there was a uh, higher secretion of IL-1 beta uh, compared to healthy controls. Oops. Um, and you can see that in that graph. Uh, the top is just the systemic JIA group compared to healthy. Um, and then uh, the lower graph is uh, separating the, sub, the, the groups of JAI patients um, by whether they had fever or not. So s systemic JAI-1 is represented by fever, and you can see higher IL-1 beta. Uh, there were only four patients. Uh, there was some elevation in IL-6. The difference was not significant. Um, there were also elevations in chemokines, chemokine receptors, toll-like 2 receptors, C1Q receptor. Um, and then they looked at gene expression studies, and there was profound um, expression of IL-1 and IL-1 receptor uh, genes, as well as some of these um, uh, other proteins, you know, that were, that were elevated. So it's a complicated system, but they found a strong signal for IL-1. So in the same group of patients, um, in nine systemic JA patients, seven of nine had systemic symptoms, eight of nine had active arthritis, some for a prolonged period of time, and half the patients had failed anti-TNF therapy. They found remission in, in their definition of remission in the paper in seven of nine patients, and this included systemic features, laboratory features of inflammation that resolved. Interestingly, uh, a sub, uh, percentage of the patient's arthritis improved. So um, two of the eight patients still remained with active arthritis despite their just systemic disease features improving. And so people obviously were very excited about this and uh, we followed up what was learned from this in different ways uh, leading to a more pivotal trial. Um, I embarked on looking at, uh, from a number of different children's hospitals in the Rocky Mountain or Intermountain area, uh, patients that had received anakinra for systemic J and really found similar results. There was a lot of chaotic uh, chart review, but that the patients profoundly had improvement in their systemic features, but um, there was a subset in our series, about 30%, that persisted with some degree of active arthritis. A more uh, systematic, a better, uh, better approach was done uh, in Paris about the same time. The Anagis study, which was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study, where they enrolled uh, patients to two arms um, in the randomization, either to receive anakinra or placebo, and then after one month, the open label. Uh, uh, aspect of the study where they all received anakinra. Improvement was partly whether the patients could taper steroids. And uh, this is a schematic. Uh, it's easy to look at that uh, top box. Um, you can see the 12 patients that enrolled in anakinra and the 12 in placebo. They, they termed um, eight of 12 responders. So we're, And then if you look uh, down below, fever was aborted in uh, 11 of the 12 patients. Um, and they uh, consistently achieve their ACRPD 30, and as the ACRPD percentage gets higher, they have less. ACRPD 70 was 42 percent, 100 percent zero. But it was a similar similar situation where the fever subsided, and there were a subset of patients uh, that had active arthritis. We've subsequently learned from titrating the medication that by using higher doses, we can get somewhat of a, a greater effect. Um, so this is uh, 
a study that was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine that led to the FDA approval of canakinumab for systemic JIA. And it was a, an international collaborative effort. Uh, the lead authors were from Printo, so the Pediatric Rheumatology International Trials Organization, and then uh, Dr. Lovell and his team in the um, PRCSG uh, also um, collaborated. And so they were what they called two trials within the study, systemic JA, all with active systemic features. Um, and that's uh, just to review uh, some of the patients with systemic JA get active systemic features, then over time the systemic features kind of burn out and patients are left with chronic arthritis. But in this study, all of them had active systemic features. They were randomly assigned in a double-blind um, fashion to canakinumab, four milligrams per kilogram, or placebo. Their primary outcome was JIA-ACR30 response. And then in the, the uh, second portion of the trial, after 32 weeks open-label treatment, patients who responded and tapered steroid were randomly assigned to continue treatment or placebo. So the primary outcome was time to flare. And so um, at first look, this is a little hard to look at, but if you look at the top, the colors represent um, what they term as the adapted JIA ACR score. So the purple is ACR 30. The number gets higher as you go across. Um, uh, inactive disease is the, is the white bar all the way to the right. So. Um, in the trial number one, comparing to placebo, the percentage of patients that met these various primary endpoints you can see is markedly different than the placebo group. That's at day 15, so there's a very acute effect from the medication. And then at day 29, you see a similar uh, pattern. Um, in terms of trial two, um, I think um, if what you can what you can see is when you look at the end of withdrawal phase comparing canakinumab to placebo, uh, patients that were withdrawn from canakinumab, um, their scores were uh, percentage-wise uh, lower than the canakinumab patients. So um, it certainly depends on the patient and their phenotype and whatnot. But in a subset of patients, canakinumab uh, has is is required and required for more than just an initial period in disease. So the IL-6 story, um, initially uh, just kind of simple translational uh, research has shown that increased levels of IL-6 in serum and synovium of uh, systemic JI patients um, is there. And what did that mean? Well, it led uh, initially um, researchers, clinical researchers in Japan to look at this. Um, I don't have um, so much detail on this, but a study by Yokota uh, from The Lancet in 2008 in a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled withdrawal phase three study uh, using tocalizumab, eight milligrams per kg every two weeks showed improved clinical and laboratory features of active disease. And then a uh, similar, similar time point as the canakinumab paper um, was a randomized uh, controlled trial of tocilizumab in systemic JIA, and the same same people did the, did the study, uh, the Printo and the PRCSG, and what they did was there were 112 children with active systemic JIA. Now these patients all had had duration for greater than six months, so you're getting into the the persistent disease subset of, of systemic JIA, and they were um, randomly assigned to either receive medication or not. The dose of the medication is dependent on uh, the weight of the patient, and is in a double-blind fashion. Patients not responding uh, were often open label, offered open-label uh, tocilizumab, and there was an open-label extension phase. Um, so this is uh, a depiction of the results. Uh, you can see on the x-axis uh, the time curve of week of the the the, um, the weeks, and then percent response on the y-axis, and then the ACR uh, score, um, ACR 30. All, all of these responses are patients that have no fever with the medication. Um, ACR 30 is at the top. You can see as time goes on, the ACR 90 score is continuing to climb. Um, uh, just for personal anecdote, a lot of the patients that have this that have a prolonged course of arthritis get kind of a bulky synovitis, and there may be a really kind of an additive effect of more drug and time that contributes. But what was really special was the oral glucocorticoid dose uh, dropped with time as well. 
So um, you can see uh, by week 52 milligrams per kilogram per day, uh, less than 0.1, and in the confidence interval of the range of kids requiring higher dose, prednisone is less. So I touched on this, the disease course can be considered monophasic. So historically, about a third of patients will present with systemic JIA, may just may not, may not have such a burden of arthritis or not have arthritis, and that clinical diagnosis is made, even though the um, ILAR criteria for systemic JI really requires arthritis, and their disease kind of peters out. So um, in that setting, there, there's a role for steroids still to suppress that inflammatory response, and I think there is a role for anakinra still. As a, um, do patients, are they responding to anakinra? Is there, is there, a, there is a subgroup that will burn out, so uh, in, in before you commit to longer-acting uh, IL-1 therapy or IL-6 therapy, um, it seems appropriate. And so there's um, guidelines that the ACR uh, has um, supported of these different uh, clinical scenarios, systemic J with active systemic features and systemic J with active arthritis. So this was updated in 2003 after these articles. And this is sort of a scary complex uh, thought process graph of how do you approach a patient with systemic JIA. And what I just described of using anakinra and steroids initially and, and kind of going with the flow uh, in many patients is what they're trying to get across. There still can be a role of uh, DMARD therapy or methotrexate, potentially in a patient who has lasting arthritis but burnt out systemic features. Um, and then the uh, commitment to one of the other longer acting, canakinumab or tocilizumab and systemic JA is, is partly dependent on how the patient presents. Is it more systemic features? Is there a profound arthritis? Are they later in their presentation? And we're guided some by those trials. Okay, so switching gears, um, I, I wanted to touch on dermatomyositis. Um, Lauren Packman has a lot of experience uh, at the Children's Hospital connected with Northwestern with um, complicated dermatomyositis patients. So she embarked on a prospective pilot study, the efficacy of a Tanercept in uh, JDMS uh, refractory to standard treatment. So there were only nine patients, and they received a pretty traditional um, weight-based dose of a Tanercept. Uh, two times a week uh, with their baseline medicines for 12 weeks is all. And then they actually assessed response uh, by a validated disease activity score, the CMAS, which is a way we assess disease activity in juvenile dermatomyositis, uh, muscle enzymes, and a um, more of a quantitative approach to looking at capillaros capillaroscopy. Uh, and they actually found um, what no improvement um, in general, you know, it's a series, um, and even some worsening in a few patients, two of the patients that did uh, worse had apparently polymorphism for TNF-alpha 308A, and they were speculating that that could play a role. Um, you guys are familiar with the RIM trial. I just uh, wanted to remind people that 48 of the 195 patients that were in RIM had juvenile dermatomyositis. Um, and the clinical improvement was defined as 20% improvement in at least three of six core set measures of disease activity. Um, JDMS predicted improvement, actually, by this hazard ratio that was significant, but that was early in the course. It was only um, at eight weeks, and then the predictive effect diminished by week 20, which uh, uh, biologically didn't make a lot of sense in terms of um, the action of rituximab. I think, uh, I know there's been a lot discussed about this trial and, and how it was designed. Uh, sub, there are subsets of, of uh, myositis and dermatomyositis patients that may or may not be more antibody associated or B cell dependent, so there's probably more to come in terms of its effect. Uh, anecdotally, um, I and, and, and uh, colleagues in my field have individual patients that seem to really benefit from rituxan and patients that are, you know, really kind of going down the road and failing other therapies and requiring a lot of prednisone. Switching gears to Kawasaki disease, um, in an epidemiology study I, I did and looking at a, uh, incidents uh, of Kawasaki disease in a number of children's hospitals, it really came out that in a, in a medium-sized U.S. children's hospital, there's about uh, one case of Kawasaki a week, so that gives you some perspective. So these are the classic diagnostic criteria for Kawasaki um, that are considered the American Heart Association criteria. Uh, to have fever for at least five days and four of the 
uh, following. So these symptoms represent the Kawasaki disease features that occur in the acute phase of the disease. And by treating, in addition to helping the child uh, not be miserable, uh, not have fever, not uh, sort of you know get, have the sequelae of all this inflammatory um, related signs and symptoms, uh, we're trying to abort the inflammatory process to prevent coronary artery aneurysm. So um, that probably is developing in the initial course of the disease, but typically that's picked up uh, by echo in the in the what's called the subacute period. So uh, in the second 10 or 15 days. Uh, of the disease course, and these are just two pictures of very dramatic uh, aneurysms. Um, so our, our, our treatment approach is to upfront, as soon as the diagnosis is made, to use IVIG two grams per kilo, and it's, it's often effective, and the classic thing is to repeat that dose um, if the child still has fever uh, uh, within 48 hours after the dose. So the, the um, if patients don't respond and they still have this driving inflammatory response, and you know, the question is now, what do you do? Uh, there's been a complicated um, kind of undulating story of the effect of steroids for Kawasaki disease, which started a paper in 1979 that showed a higher incidence of coronary abnormalities in patients who received prolonged prednisone. Now, these patients weren't receiving IVIG. Um, the series was written from Japan, which we now know that uh, patients have a, tend to have a more severe phenotype than the North American uh, population. And, and also, it was around the time when Kawasaki disease was really, uh, people were becoming more aware of it, and there's a lot of concern, and there still is, that there's a significant infectious component, and then maybe we shouldn't be using immune modulating or suppressing uh, medications. So um, various studies, and I got a little bit excited and, and went through them all, um, but they've shown um, variable results. So uh, Dr. Neuberger from Boston Children's in the middle study published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, that the efficacy of a single pulse IV methylprednisolone dose did not improve the coronary outcomes um, at weeks one and five. The question is, you know, why did they just do one pulse and maybe not three in a row? But when uh, retrospectively people have looked at longer courses of prednisone, it appears that it's had some protective effect on the development um, of coronary uh, lesions. So this is an interesting study from Japan that was published in Lancet in 2012. Um, Dr. Kobayashi has a Kobayashi um, Kawasaki disease score, so only patients that met a high enough score to have a significant risk for having um, uh, developing coronary uh, aneurysms were enrolled. They had 74 Japanese hospitals participating, and that they were uh, randomized to IVIG plus prednisone or IVIG alone, and the prednisone course was continued for a number of weeks, so it got the patient through the period of Kawasaki disease where, because Kawasaki disease is a is an uh, episodic phenomenon. It gets them through that kind of natural history of the problem. And um, what they showed was, and none of the patients had coronary lesions when they were enrolled. Uh, so the incidence of uh, coronary abnormalities was lower in the IVIG and prednisone group. How this relates to the North American population um, of patients developing Kawasaki's is not exactly clear. So in terms of biologics, um, there was a study from the Journal of Pediatrics that really uh, just was an open-label trial of etanercept as adjunctive therapy, where it was given after the initial IVI dose in just 15 patients, and it was shown that it was safe and well-tolerated. So that was a start. And then um, there is currently a phase two trial, a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study of the effects of etanercept in children presenting, so initially with Kawasaki disease, it's being uh, run out of the Seattle Children's Hospital. And um, in terms of infliximab and Kawasaki disease, um, the, uh, a, an open-labeled case series is what this is. So 20 patients given a moderate dose of infliximab within 10 days of disease onset. You know, it was 90% uh, effective in improving inflammatory symptoms and markers. So it doesn't tell a lot, except that it seems to um, decrease the inflammatory response. Um, this is a study that was a retrospective uh, look. Infliximab for IVIG resistance and Kawasaki disease. So uh, patients that were seen at the Boston Children's Hospital, uh, duration of fever and coronary dimensions in patients with IVIG resistance whose 
so they compared patients whose first retreatment was with IVIG compared to infliximab. And the infliximab group showed some faster resolution of fever and fewer days of hospitalization, similar coronary artery dimensions. Um, this is a more recent study from Lancet, um, which um, looked at the intensification of the primary therapy for Kawasaki disease. So it was a phase three double-blind placebo-controlled trial of infliximab at the same dose. And the primary outcome was difference between the groups and retreatment resistance. So whether if you got IVIG or IVIG and infliximab, is there a difference in requiring retreatment with a second dose of IVIG or retreat or another approach to, to sort of needing further therapy? And it showed that there were no difference. Um, the study, I suppose, was underpowered on potentially on some levels where both arms really didn't need retreatment. Um, and, uh, but there was a reduced fever duration in the patients that received infliximab and, and um, some difference in the uh, left anterior descending Z-score uh, of the dimension of the, of the coronary. So uh, switching, switching gears um, to round out the talk, uh, I, I wanted to talk about the cryopyrin-associated auto-inflammatory syndromes. So these are rare problems, um, but uh, IL-1 inhibition, uh, canakinumab, is, is approved um, uh, for the problem. It's a phenotypic spectrum. So currently on uh, In Fevers, which is a website, and the website's there, there's 175 sequence variants of the NLRP3 mutations. Um, and so that encodes the binding domain of cryopyrin. So I have a schematic here that um, a cryopyrin is a protein within the inflammasome, and the inflammasome is thought to pl play a key role in the auto-inflammatory response, especially with these auto-inflammatory syndromes. So within in the schematic there, there, you can see mutations in other proteins like pyrin that occurs with FMF um, that's involved in the inflammasome, but some deregulation of the protein causes some instability, the inflammasome, uh, to sort of uh, make um, biomechanics uh, more simple than it really is, and activate, activate caspase 1 complex, which activates IL-1 beta, and then produces inflammatory responses, which for this syndrome in its worst form um, uh, can occur in the neonatal uh, period, and over time there's a profound deforming arthritis. Um, a non-puritic uh, rash that's hive-like and not responsive to antihistamine, uh, neutrophils in the blood and the tissues, ocular disease that can lead to blindness and hearing loss, as well as um, aseptic meningitis. So uh, moving forward, the um, spectrum of the illness, I have these abbreviations here, but it's familial cold auto-inflammatory syndrome is the most minor form of the problem, and it tends to present in um, school or teenage years. Uh, the patients actually can develop that similar rash. It's often triggered by cold exposure, but they don't really have those other inflammatory symptoms, so it's, it's possible they really don't need biologic therapy. Their risk of amyloidosis is low. But um, within the phenotypic spectrum is Muckle-Wells syndrome, and those patients um, do have uh, those features or risk of ocular complications, and their quality of life is low. And untreated, if they're classically a Muckle-Wells patient, about 25% develop uh, amyloidosis to some degree. So their treatment with IL-1 antagonism is important. And then NOMID is the, is the, is the uh, portion of the spectrum that's quite severe. Um, so just to finish up the talk, the center of this picture is the same as what I showed you, but this gives a, a higher up view of um, what's going on where you have uh, secretion of uh, interleukin-1 beta you know, outside the cell, but then potentially cycling back on a membrane stimulating NF-kappa-B, more transcription of cytokines and getting um, a profound increase in cytokine um, concentrations and activity, and if you look closely at the graph, uh, you can see how NF-kappa-B can be stimulated by other uh, mutations, uh, such as what gives us Blau's disease, or sometimes called uh, childhood sarcoid disease, or the TRAPS um, disease, tumor necrosis factor associated periodic fever syndrome. Um, and we're just starting to learn how uh, cytokine inhibitors can can help these problems. There's currently an international trial uh, with Novartis to look at uh, FMF, uh, HIDS, and um, 
uh, traps uh, with canakinumab. So uh, that's, that's it. I suppose this concludes the summit, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you.